Hey, Tom the Nutritionist here, and I'll tell you what, I am so excited to be sharing with you my good friend, Dr. Tom O'Brien. And, uh, you know, Tom is a international recognized speaker, workshop leader who works with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and he talks about a lot of the conditions associated with gluten reactions, not only in the intestines, but outside of the intestines as well. Not everybody's as familiar as, uh, as Dr. Tom is. And basically, Tom went around. And he interviewed 29 of the world experts on gluten-associated reactions. And he put together, I would have to say, Tom, the definitive resource for anybody about anything regarding gluten uh, called the Gluten Summit. And I was blessed to be part of that group as well as so many like thought leaders in this industry, world-renowned gastroenterologists and people who came up with the actual diagnostic naming of conditions in celiac disease and whatnot, the MARSH uh, protocols, for example, and whatnot. So we're really, really honored, really blessed to have Dr. Uh, O'Brien with us here today, and he's going to answer some questions for us regarding what may be troublesome for you. So thank you so much for being here, Tom. Well, thank you, Tom. It's a real pleasure, and it's a it's a personal pleasure to support the launching of your book because your knowledge is just so critical for people to know and you know to get this information out there about how foods have such an impact in our lives. And you and I, as you know, we've shared the stage many times and we're carrying similar messages from a little different perspective, but the same message that what you put in your mouth is either inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. You know, there's no neutrals except healthy water. I don't know of any other neutrals. <laughs> I don't know of any. Yeah. So, and the more that people learn and recognize what foods are inflammatory to them, the more they have the option, the choice to achieve higher levels of health. Oh, because, yeah. uh, it, you know, Every degenerative disease, as far as I know, every degenerative disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, plugging up of your pipes, atherosclerosis, every disease, cancers, they're diseases of inflammation. At the cellular level, it's always inflammation. Always. Yeah. So the rule is stop throwing gasoline on the fire. <laughs> right? And you know, I mean, it just makes sense when you think of it that way, and yeah. people don't know what that means, but when you eat foods that your immune system is saying, this is a problem, and your immune system's trying to protect you from that food, you're throwing gasoline on the fire. Mm. Yeah. And so the concept is, if you can identify the foods that you're sensitive to, get them out of there. No, you can't have a little when you're sensitive. Well, can I just put a little gasoline on the fire and still put the fire out? Unlikely. <laughs> no. Unlikely. <laughs> Unlikely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, get well and then see if you can have those foods again, whatever they are, whatever foods they are. So let me clarify, okay? I learned this from the Institute for Functional Medicine. Okay, you're a faculty member of IFM. And uh, the the key point that we're we're taught all the time is many of the diseases start in the gut. The vast majority of the immune cells lie in the gut. If ever you're gonna cause this irritation, this inflammation you speak of that's behind most all diseases then it mostly initiates in the gut. So why aren't we looking at that which travels through the gut and has the potential to excite those immune cells more than anything else? Why aren't we looking at the 25 plus tons of foreign matter we're going to pull through our mouth in the form of food before we look at meds, before we look at anything? 25, 25 tons in a lifetime. In a lifetime. In a lifetime, right. 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 So it's like, oh my gosh, right? It doesn't it just make logical sense that you would examine what you are taking in, putting through your gut as being an either initiator or a promoter, mediator of your disorder. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's your arthritis. It doesn't matter if it's your migraines. It doesn't matter if it's your irritable bowel. You should be looking at food first. Is that is that basically what you're saying? Well, you know, Tom, as our mutual friend and mentor, Dr. Alessio Fasano says, right. uh, who is the chair of pediatric gastroenterology at Mass General Hospital at Harvard. Yeah. So all, all of the residents in pediatric gastroenterology go through a training under this guy. Yeah, All of them do. So that gives you a sense of the credibility that he has and the level of expertise he has. He tells us that 
and all doctors know this, 70% of the immune system, about 70% of the immune system is in your gut. We have four different immune systems in our body. There's one in the gut, there's one in the blood vessels, like when you get a blood draw and they look at white blood cells, that's the one that's in your blood vessels. There's one in the liver and there's one in the brain. Mm -hmm. They're very different. They talk to each other, but they're very different. But 70% of all of the immune system in your body is in your gut. And Dr. Fasano asked the question of all of us, why? <laughs> why? Why would nature or the creator, however you look at it in your own life, why would we develop where the largest place, see, your, your immune system is the armed forces in your body, mm. Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Navy, the armed forces is there to protect you. Mm -hmm. And if there's no need for protection, protection, you know, the ships just lay in harbor, they're cruising around a little bit here and there, but they're not active. But they're there on the ready when they're needed. 70% of everything in your body that's on the ready is in your gut. Right. Because that's where we get more exposure to what might potentially harm us that we need protection from than anywhere else. Right. It's... It's the food that we, as you say, the 25 tons that we're going to eat in a lifetime. The average adult eats 25 tons of food in a lifetime. And the way that immune system works in the gut is that it begins more or less in the mouth, more or less, with our taste buds. But the major scouts to identify if there's a problem are right inside the small intestine. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they send periscopes up into the tube of the intestines when the food's coming down. You know, and the periscopes are checking out everything that's going by to see if there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And when a problem is recognized, the alarm bells go off. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole cascade effect in your immune system. Mm -hmm. But it starts in your gut. The point is, it's in your gut. And the reason it's there is because that's where the vast majority of the gasoline comes from that fuels the inflammation that is the mechanism that kills off your cells that eventually manifests wherever your weak link is. You know, you pull at a chain, it breaks at the weakest link. So one end, the middle, the other end, it's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever your weak link is, that's where you're going to get your symptoms when you pull mm -hmm. on the chain too hard. Mm -hmm. And the pull on the chain is inflammation. That's the major pull in the body. You want to be healthy. You just need to know these basic foundational concepts and live with an understanding of these basic concepts that what you put in your mouth turns genes on or turns genes off. So what genes are you turning on? Are you turning the, on the genes for inflammation to protect you? The Navy says, we got a problem here. Or are you turning genes on that are really fire hoses to put the fire out, like the antioxidants in, in fresh organic berries, you know, and things like that. Mm -hmm. What are you turning on? What are you turning off? And the, the, the arena where all that occurs is in the intestines. Mm. All right. So yes, the answer is yes. Look at the food. Look at what's going to irritate the intestines. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, 70% of your immune cells, why wouldn't you calm the gut down? Okay. That makes right. too much sense to ignore, right? Now, I've been thinking, you know, I, I know you. I mean, we're in communications. You're traveling the globe. I, every time I try and get a hold of you, oh, he's in Portugal. He's in Ireland. He's in South America, you know. Why are you doing this, Tom? I mean, I, I get it. You understand the, the gut reactions, but you're focusing a lot of energy on, on gluten. And what is it about gluten that's causing the problems? And why does it matter so much to you? Why are you Why are you spending your life energy? I mean, your time, your money, your energy going around educating the populace about this one specific thing. What is it about gluten and, and why does it matter to you? Okay, that's two separate questions. Yes. First, the gluten question. Mm -hmm. Immunologists have known for many, many years that autoimmune diseases, when your immune system attacks your own tissue, like your brain or your thyroid, Autoimmune diseases are the number three cause of getting sick and dying in the mm -hmm. world. Yeah. Number three. And they've accepted that for many, many years. Now, we think of them separately, like psoriasis, you go to a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. MS, you go to a neurologist. Yeah, right. Uh, rheumatology, you know, if you have rheumatoid, you go to a rheumatologist. We look at them all separately. They're in their kind of like silos, like a mm -hmm. corn yeah. silo on a farm. <laughs> yeah. Big, yeah, um, yeah. Everybody's in their silo and they look in their own world. 
But when you look at the mechanisms, the mechanisms are very similar in the development of autoimmune diseases across the board. Mm -hmm. And the mechanisms that have been identified, once again, by Dr. Fasano and many others now, Professor Schoenfeld and many others, the mechanism is the trilogy. I refer to it as the trilogy in the development of autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. There is the genetic vulnerability. Okay. You can't do anything about your genes. You, you got the gene, you got the gene. It right. doesn't mean you're going to get the problem. It means you're vulnerable of getting the problem, right? Right, right. So genetic vulnerability, an environmental trigger mm -hmm. that sets off that gene. It's like the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, yeah. That environmental trigger. And then intestinal permeability or... Many people have heard the term leaky gut. Yeah, yeah, That is the trilogy in the development of autoimmune diseases. And the research papers have been coming out now for quite a few years that say you can arrest, and that's their language, arrest the development of autoimmune disease by healing the intestines. Mm. So if you heal the damage, the leaking gut, so that these larger molecules that are going through the intestines, you know, when you eat food, they can't get into the bloodstream because the damage in the gut is healed, then that environmental trigger can't get in there to turn on the genes and develop wherever the weak link in your chain is, whether it's seizures, whether it's brain deterioration diseases, whether it's lupus, that you arrest the development of those autoimmune diseases. And we know that the most common food trigger that causes or contributes to the intestinal permeability, the most common food trigger is gluten. Mm, yeah. There's over 20,000 studies now mm. on this in the medical literature of how gluten can cause so many different problems. Yeah. Wherever the weak link is, that's where you're going to get your symptoms. It's not just the gut like in celiac disease, mm -hmm. that's where we first learned about this. And many thousands of studies were on celiac disease, which is the disease, your, your intestines are a tube, the tube's 20, 25 feet long, kind of winds around in there. The inside of the tube is lined with shag carpeting. Mm -hmm. This shag is where calcium's absorbed, this shag vitamin C, this shag the B vitamins, this shag different proteins. All the shags are the shag carpeting in the tube absorb different nutrients. Right. Celiac disease is the autoimmune disease triggered by gluten when your shags wear down and you get Berber. Mm. So if you damage your intestines and you get Berber, you don't absorb calcium. Mm -hmm. That's why in the annals of internal medicine, they say every osteoporotic patient needs to be checked yeah. for celiac disease as celiac disease is often the cause of their osteoporosis. Mm. So I show that study, as you know, in many of my lectures, and I say, so doctors, if the annals of internal medicine say every osteoporotic patient just needs to be checked, which one are you not going to check? Yeah. And their eyes are just kind of glaze over, you know, that they've never thought of that before. And that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. So gluten is the, the most common trigger. Mm that opens up the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. Mm. That's why I talk about gluten. Ah. That's the main reason why is because if you're going to have an impact, if you really want to see our food's going to help me, our food's not going to help me. And if you, you've only got one shot, what do you do? Well, for, in my book, the first thing you do is, Check to see if you have a gluten sensitivity. Yeah. Get it out of there because it's so very common. And you and I have known many personal cases yeah. of women that have had recurrent miscarriages. Yeah, yeah. And they go gluten free and now they have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby, mm -hmm. you know, or seizures mm -hmm. that go away or um, uh, hepatitis, yeah. the, a liver problem that goes away or thyroid disease, Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroid disease. Yeah, all the time. It yeah. goes away. You know, we see it all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it's just because it's such a common irritant that you get so many beneficial results just by checking to see, is this a problem for you? Mm. Now, I'm not saying everyone needs to go gluten-free. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. 
What I am saying is that everyone will benefit from considering, Mm. is my immune system fighting gluten right now? Mm -hmm. And if your immune system is fighting gluten, it's like the army's on full alert, do you ignore it? Mm. Once you understand the mechanisms for the number three cause of getting sick and dying in the world, that the mechanism, that, that trilogy includes the environmental trigger and the most common environmental trigger is gluten and what might it look like for an autoimmune condition it might be alzheimer's mm-hmm. you know nobody gets alzheimer's in their 60s or 70s you get alzheimer's in your 20s and 30s it just takes decades of killing off your brain cells until there's so much damage and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse until there's so much damage that it's obvious yeah you know, and it continues to progress and get worse quicker Mm. as more damage occurs. So it's a decades long process. All of our diseases are years and years to decades long processes before you ever get symptoms. So by the time you get symptoms, this thing's been cooking for quite a while. Yeah, right. Right. And so what you want to look for is where's the gasoline coming from Mm. on that fire? Mm -hmm. How come? I'm getting type 2 diabetes at this point in my life. All right, yeah, I no, I cut down the sugars. I'm not eating a lot of sugar. How come I'm getting diabetes? Where's the inflammation coming from? Mm. That's a question that if all of our viewers would just ask, where's the inflammation come from? And, you know, your books, I've seen your books in the past, and you are so good at clearly painting the picture mm. of how to work well with foods, and why do we want to consider foods? Well, the bottom line is stop throwing gasoline on the fire. Mm, mm. And I've had the privilege of tasting your wife's cooking <laughs> on a number of occasions. It's really good. So those recipes are just slam dunk in this house. You know, yeah. we just love your cookbooks. And so the concept, though, is identify the foods that you're sensitive to and then eliminate them for a period of time. Mm, okay. Okay. That's that, that totally aligns with what I've been seeing in clinical practice for the last 10 years, Tom. And that's why we keep bumping into each other at, at conferences and, and on stages and whatnot. You know, the reality for me is what I hear you saying, the literature is now clearly showing, clearly showing that if you have intestinal permeability and you have some sort of food trigger, environmental trigger, bacterial trigger, some sort of trigger coming in, that you will contribute to the third most common disease issue that we're having, autoimmune diseases, uh, right now on the planet. Um, I'm also hearing you say that when you irritate the gut lining, you may uh, impede on nutrient absorption. So that could contribute not just to autoimmune disease, but to neurological decline, as you were speaking with Alzheimer's, but also Parkinson's and and just basically dementia and whatever else you want to see it in the way. Osteoporosis. Absolutely. And, and this, actually, this actually killed my father, Tom. It oh. killed my father. That, yeah. Uh, my father died of a heart attack, mm-hmm. and at autopsy, the forensic pathologist called me and said, we don't know why your father died. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he had a heart attack, but there was no evidence of a clot, and he only had 30% blockage in his left descending coronary. Now, that artery is called the widow maker. That's oh. not the good, you know, you don't want that, but 30%, and the pathologist said, it's not enough. That shouldn't have happened. We suspected foul play. He said, I'm sorry, but that's the law. So they did toxicology screens. There was nothing. Hmm. They looked for needle marks anywhere on the body. There was nothing. He did lung biopsy to see if he'd breathed anything. There was nothing. Yeah. They couldn't identify the cause of death. So that sent me on a hunt in 1990 to figure out what had happened. Yeah. And um, one of the calls I made is to our good friend, Dr. Jeff Bland. Oh, yeah. And Jeff said, oh, Tom, I'm so sorry. Call Kilmer. So I called Dr. Kilmer McCulley. Yeah. And I said, Dr. McCulley, it's Tom O'Brien. He said, well, hello, Tom, because we had met. And I told him what happened. He said, I'm so sorry. Now, Kilmer McCulley's story is worth repeating here. Dr. McCulley was at Harvard doing first-class research on the impact of vitamins on health back in the 60s and 70s. One of the pioneers helping us begin to understand when the science was good enough to identify the mechanisms at the cellular level 
as to what was going on. Dr. McCulley was one of the pioneers publishing in very reputable first-tier medical journals, mm -hmm. his research papers. And he was writing papers that said, we have to put folic acid in the cereal. That's a B vitamin. Mm -hmm. Because thousands of people are dying from not enough folic acid. If we put it in the cereal, it's an easy way for them to get it. Hmm. And everyone's heard that women of childbearing age need to take folic acid. Right. And this is why is the mechanism that Dr. McCulley talked about. Hmm. And they thought he was a nutcase. Right. There, because no one was <laughs> writing about that back then. Right. No. He was a pioneer. And there was a lobbying effort to fire him. Oh. Kilmer McCulley was fired from Harvard. Whoa. And the only place he could get a job because he was blacklisted was a basement laboratory in the VA hospital in Maryland. Wow. He went from the pillars of success to a basement research lab. Wow. But he kept doing his research, you know, and publishing his papers. Now he's considered the godfather <laughs> right? of homocysteine research. And Homocysteine is one of those risk factors that we now know can set people up for wherever the weak link is. If they have an elevated homocysteine, then they might have a problem wherever the weak link is. Sure. So there are many different conditions that have been associated with an elevated homocysteine. Right. So I called Dr. McCulley and I said, Dr. McCulley, I know that an elevated homocysteine level in the blood will cause vasospasm. That's when a blood vessel spasms. Yep. And he said, yes, Tom. And I said, can that happen at the site of a 30% blockage, effectively making it a 100% blockage? And he said, Tom, we see that in the laboratory quite often. Oh. That's how my father died. Wow. So I checked myself. I have elevated homocysteine levels. My sister does. My brother does. 19 of my 21 first cousins do. Whoa. It's genetic. Yeah. And it'll kill you. It killed my father. And it's so easy to fix. You just take the B vitamins. Folic acid, B6, B12, trimethylglycine, and in three weeks, you're fine. And as mm. long as you take the vitamins to help your body work with homocysteine, you're fine. Mm. So that's what killed my father. Now, where does the B vitamin deficiency come from? Because my whole family has gluten sensitivity. My father's brothers and sisters that I've checked have gluten sensitivity. So my father had a gluten sensitivity unbeknownst to us. This was 1990. Yeah. And so he had B vitamin deficiencies because the B complex of vitamins is the most common water soluble vitamin deficiency with a gluten sensitivity. Right. Because they're absorbed in the upper part of the small intestine. That's where most of the inflammation is when you have a problem with gluten. It begins in the small intestine, the upper part of the small intestine. You can go anywhere, but it begins there. So you don't absorb your B vitamins or mm. you don't absorb calcium mm. in the earlier reference I gave you. Yeah. So when you have a B vitamin deficiency because you have inflammation, because you're eating this food that your body doesn't like, you get a B vitamin deficiency. And then whatever the complex complications are down the road from the B vitamin deficiency, which may be brain deterioration. There are so many things or a pregnancy loss or birth defects in the pregnancy, sure. children that are born with spina bifida mm. or cleft palate. Yes. Uh, because mom had a B vitamin deficiency. That's one of the reasons why that happens. Mm. And it's so simple to fix. Mm. You know? And a gluten sensitivity may manifest as inflammation in the intestines, B vitamin deficiencies, elevated homocysteine, and then wherever the complication manifests of an elevated homocysteine. Mm. that's the way you have to look at food mm. is that this causes this causes this causes this causes that and you go to the doctor and you're complaining of that that symptom mm. like right. you know i've got a little asthma i can't breathe very well well rarely is it about your lungs rarely is the lungs a problem and we have helped so many hundreds of people with breathing difficulties over the years and asthmatics yeah, and yeah. rarely do i treat the lungs yeah. for asthma right yeah. You have to treat the body that has the symptom wherever the weak link is. Mm. So stop throwing gasoline on the fire first. Mm -hmm. Find out what kind of foods work for you first. And then notice how your body responds. Mm. Okay. That makes sense. Now, what I'm wanting to seal into people's consciousness is the likelihood that they are dealing with this. So if we were to look at the general population, I, 
we know the conservative data. We know 0.4% may have a wheat allergy. We know that uh, approximately 1% will have celiac disease. And we know another approximate 6% may have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, right? According to the conservative data. So bare bones minimum 7.5%, 7.4% of the population walking around is going to have some sort of gluten associated reaction. Now, as a clinician who himself reacts to gluten and has noticed huge changes in my own body and my own clinical practice, I think those numbers are higher, much, much higher. I'm going to ask, what is your opinion? How many people do you think are walking around with gluten-associated reactions? I have a training program for healthcare practitioners. Mm -hmm. We certify them mm -hmm. as certified gluten practitioners. So I talk to a lot of them. We have about 450 now, I think. Mm -hmm. I talk to them when I see them at seminars and things and look for a consensus. And their experience is very similar to mine. Mm. There's some background information people need to know about the politics of testing mm. that gets in the way of healthcare. It shouldn't, but it does. But when you do the right tests, mm -hmm. comprehensive enough tests, mm -hmm. when you ask the armed forces, Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, when you ask the right way, what you find in clinical practice is somewhere between three to six out of every 10 people that come to see you with a health complaint hmm. actually have elevated antibodies to gluten hmm. and you put them on a gluten-free diet and they get better. So it's 30 to 60%, depending on which clinician you talk to. Wow. 30 to 60% of people that come to see you because they feel sick, mm. meaning what they're doing isn't working well enough. They feel sick. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in that ballpark is what I have found clinically over the years, mm -hmm. just again and again and again. And it's being validated now by our CGPs, our certified gluten practitioners. Mm -hmm. ah. It's huge. It's a huge problem. That's why I talk about this problem. There are many, many problems. As, as you referenced, you know, I'm on the faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine, and we teach a five-day course, five full days for doctors. They leave their practices, they leave their families and their homes, they fly to wherever the course is being taught, and we've got them from 6.30 in the morning till 6.30 at night, and then their brains are fried, you know, so they have to go get something to eat and sleep and rest for the next day. You've been there, you know. Seven times, yeah. And the, the introductory talks are all, hi, welcome, we're glad you're here, and here's the problem with healthcare right now. Here's the statistics as to how bad it is. The first person that they hear after they've been welcomed is me. Yeah. Talking about science. Because my role is to talk to them about the gut. Mm -hmm. and intestinal permeability, taking it back to the earlier question you asked about the gut, yeah. that so many of our wizened health practitioners, the doctors who have been out there teaching and training for decades, 20 years, 30 years, and the ones from previous generations who taught for decades, mm -hmm. they all, and even Hippocrates, yeah. they all say the same thing, the gut. You've got to deal with the gut because that's where the inflammation, the bomb fire begins. Mm -hmm. And then wherever the weak link is, that's where you're going to feel it. Yes. My godmother, it was her liver. Mm -hmm. My father was his blood vessels because of an elevated homocysteine. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter how you feel. The foods you eat, if they're triggering inflammation for you, it's going to affect you where the weak link in your chain is, mm. wherever it is, wherever it is. Wow. So I'm going to clarify then. What you're finding is between 30 to 60% of people who present to your clinical practice and to other practitioners who've graduated from your programs, 30 to 60%, it doesn't matter what they're presenting with. It could be mood disorders. It could be skin disorders. It could be Alzheimer's. It could be migraines. It doesn't matter what they're presenting with. They get better when they eliminate foods from their diet that are irritating them. And one of the key suspects is gluten. Is that correct? 
That's exactly right, Tom. Okay. Sometimes they get completely better. Yes. Most of the time they get noticeably better, right. but there's some damage they've got to deal with, whether yes. it's in your joints or muscles or your brain, you know, so they, they have to do some other things with it, but they know, and then when they go back and they have a little gluten, they feel bad. I, I, yeah. Best visit with most of my patients is their third visit or fourth visit when they come back and say, oh my gosh, last night, I've, I've been feeling so good, it's great, but last night I went out, and, you know, there's nothing to eat in this restaurant, and I thought, I'll just have one piece of pizza, oh. uh, it's fine. <laughs> and they, they, they report, I was throwing up, or I felt so sick, or my right. abdominal complaint, or my headaches came back, and I, yeah. and I just feel sick. And I said, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Congratulations. No one can argue with you. Yes. It's not a mental exercise you eat it you don't feel good but you have to get to but people say well I don't feel bad when I eat gluten that's because you're in a state of high inflammation all the time you don't notice a difference you don't notice a difference yeah. get the inflammatory foods out of there clean up so you're not inflamed and then notice what happens when you have that food again I don't recommend having gluten again but uh, so I'm not recommending that I have to be careful I don't recommend ever doing a gluten challenge. It's called a gluten challenge. But so many people, they feel better. Say, well, I can have a little. And then they feel terrible afterwards. Yeah. You know, that's interesting because when I was approached by somebody and they said, what is the most important thing to you in your clinical practice? What is it the thing that you feel you have to share with the world that will help them more than anything else? And immediately, the elimination diet popped to mind. Yeah. I was like, yeah. look, I've had so many people with chronic conditions of 31 years of rheumatoid arthritis, you know, an older gentleman, and he was a nine out of 10 out of pain. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't garden. He couldn't dance with his wife. He couldn't do anything, right? Elimination yeah. type diet, boom. You know, a couple weeks later, what do you have? You have someone who's in yoga classes, gardening, dancing with his wife again, you know, someone with chronic fatigue. They can't even raise their head to talk to me. They're so fatigued, right? 12 days after on the elimination diet, boom, they snap out. They're 15 hours. They're type A personality now. They're got a wait, hilarious wait, wait, sense wait, of humor. Wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. A couple of weeks for someone who can hardly walk and he's dancing with his wife and 12 <laughs> days she can't lift her head? Really, man? I mean, aren't you exaggerating? I mean, I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing our audience, and I'll tell the audience, no, he's not exaggerating. We see this all the time. It's unbelievable the results you see. It's unbelievable. It really is. It really is. But, you know, I had to bring you here, Tom, to talk to people because— one of the things that you had said earlier was really it takes it takes you getting it all out, okay? Uh, Dr. Ken Fine in 2004 told me, he, I heard him on this broadcast, he said, 100% effort equals 100% results. And I went to Alicia Fasano and I said, hey, Dr. Fasano, do you believe this? 100% effort equals 100% results? He says, Tom, 99% effort equals zero results. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. You know, you were saying that you can't have a little bit of gasoline that you put on the fire. A little bit of gasoline goes a long way. So the, the challenge that I have is convincing people that this is true. I mean, I looked in the literature, and Hippocrates mentions this. You go back into the 1700s, the 1800s. If you find old medical texts, you'll see that they show a little bit it goes a long way. So is that what you're finding as well, that you can't, you can't have that little cross-contamination or exposure? You, you can't have that one little bite because it makes all the difference in the world. <clears throat> Uh, Tom, in the journal Gastroenterology, they published a paper mm -hmm. where they looked at 1,700 celiac patients mm -hmm. and 3,384 of their first-degree relatives. Can you tell that I talk about this a lot because I've got <laughs> the numbers down? Right. 3,384 yeah. of their first-degree relatives. That's their siblings and parents. Yes. They followed them for 22 years. Mm. Every year, they got questionnaires filled out like, how, how are you feeling? Can we get copies of your medical records? Mm. Um, how's your diet been? Are you strict on the diet? Do you cheat once in a while? Overall, how, how are you doing? Right. What did they find after 22 years? Those, oh, oh by the way, the standard mortality ratio okay. is two to one with celiac. What that means, if I have celiac, mm -hmm. I'm 63, and my brother does not have celiac, he's 62. I'm twice as likely to die at 63 than when my brother gets to be 63 of something, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. Right. I'm twice as likely to die at 35 
than when my brother gets to be 35. I'm twice as likely to die at 90 than when my brother gets to be 90. That's the SMR, two to one. Right. With or without a gluten-free diet. Right. They're still going to die early. Okay. So they followed these 5,000 people for 22 years. What did they find? Those that were really strict and doing their very best to follow the gluten-free diet, their, their SMR was 0.5. Hmm. Half as often were they dying instead of twice as often. Mm -hmm. Because they're working hard at making sure not to throw gasoline on the fire. Right. Those that were not likely to follow the gluten-free diet, and that's the category that the authors of the study used, not likely mm -hmm. was defined as once per month. Mm. That's not likely to be stringent on the diet. Their SMR, their likelihood of dying early in life was six to one. Oof. They were six times more likely to die. Now, it's not just the death, but it's all the disease, the, mm. it's called the morbidity, all of the suffering that comes from diabetes, the lack of energy, the suffering from Alzheimer's, the suffering from heart attacks and surviving the heart attack, but then you know, not having the energy anymore, all of that morbidity before the early death. Mm. Six times more likely if they had gluten once a month. Mm. So and my once. term for this, and, and I know you've heard me say this, you can't be a little pregnant. <laughs> yeah. You can't have a little gluten if right. you have the sensitivity. Ah, that makes sense. That makes too much sense to ignore. Okay. I have to tell you one case study. I have this gentleman, a well-known, world-renowned architect, right? And his wife's a world-renowned artist. And uh, it's interesting because he can't walk into her kitchen. She goes in there with her granddaughter all the time, and she's making all these recipes, and there's flour in the air, and there's all this stuff all over the kitchen. He can't go into the kitchen. His tea, he gets these terrible reactions just going into the kitchen, right? So he went down a half a block from her house, and he's an architect. He built his own house so he can have a clean kitchen. Isn't that funny? I mean, that is so funny. when you ask people, you know, is it possible? Can I have just a little bit? Would I feel a little bit better if I get, a, you know, most of the gluten out? It sounds like the research in our own clinical experience is saying unequivocally, no, get it out, keep it out, and you'll feel better. That's well, um, you will feel better if you reduce the gluten. Mm -hmm. Some people do um, feel better just when they cut it down to once a week or once or twice a week. They do feel better most of the time. But... The underlying immune reaction, it doesn't matter how you feel, one eighth of a thumbnail, the science says that's all it takes is an eighth of a thumbnail to activate the Marines mm. in your intestines, and then you're going to have elevated antibodies anywhere from three to six months from one little exposure. Yeah. But you're going to feel a little bit better. You feel a little better, but you still have the inflammatory cascade pulling on the chain. That's why the SMR for celiacs that are gluten-free is two to one. Mm. It's still two to one, the overall, because they get a little once in a while. Yeah. You know, getting gluten, getting exposed to gluten, where are the challenging points going to be for people? They're going to go on this gluten-free diet, and we're going to provide lots of recipes. We're going to provide enough resources that they can survive without eating out once or getting exposed anywhere. I mean, that's, that's what we've done. We've got meticulous lists of all the hidden sources, everything. But in your experience, how difficult is that in the U.S.? If you want to try and go out and eat at restaurants and shop at normal grocery stores, what's the likelihood of someone getting glutened? Yes, I've got two research papers that I printed out so that we could, um, I could give you accurate numbers. Uh -huh. And the first one, the, the title of the paper is Gluten Contamination of Naturally Gluten-Free Flours and Starches. Yeah, by Tricia Thompson. Yep. Yes. Uh, and this one, um, and what they say, and in their graph, when they looked at buckwheat flours, mm -hmm which are supposed to be okay on a gluten-free diet. Yeah. They looked at eight, 18 different buckwheat flours. 11 of them had toxic levels of gluten in them. Yep. 11 out of 18. Corn flour and corn meal. They looked at 104 samples. 17 of the samples had toxic levels of gluten. Yep. It's cross-contamination. Absolutely. So 
it's almost, and then the second paper that I wanted to talk about is one that's coming out next month from the yeah. FDA. Yes. And the scientists from the FDA looked at 275 foods um, that are naturally gluten-free or labeled gluten-free. Yeah, quote unquote. Right. And what did they find <laughs> out? So what they found was that, hold on a minute, let me get the exact numbers for you. The non-gluten-free labeled foods, mm -hmm. so they're naturally gluten-free, so there's no gluten-free label on it, Right. 19.4% of them, 36 of them out of 207, no, 36 out of 186 foods mm. had toxic levels of gluten in them. Mm. That's the corn meals and things like that. This is coming out by the FDA next month. Sheesh. Yeah. So almost 20% of the food that you can buy, rice crackers and and uh, amaranth cookies, and mm -hmm. almost 20% of all of that is contaminated with toxic levels of gluten. Yep. So it's not that there's, a, you know, Japanese restaurants, three of the last eight Japanese restaurants I've been in, I've asked the waitress, please ask the chef if they put flour in the sushi rice. Yeah. And so, no, 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 we don't do that. I, I understand. Please ask the chef. And three times they came back and said, oh, yes, actually, they do. Yeah. So they put flour in the sushi rice because it makes it a little bit stickier. Right. And you think you're being safe. So unfortunately, there's no place that's safe to eat mm -hmm. if you have gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. It's not safe. Mm -hmm. You need as much protection as you can possibly get. Mm. You know, that's what we found out. And that's why we do what we do, Tom. Honestly. In clinical practice, I used to spend the last 15 minutes printing out recipes and guidelines for my clients because I felt if they didn't have the resources, if they couldn't cook the food at home, they were almost doomed. There was no way they could succeed. So, of course, we launched, you know, eight years ago, the Whole Life Nutrition Cookbook, which took off through the entire Institute for Functional Medicine faculty. Thanks, guys, for supporting that. And then also the uh, Whole Life Nutrition Cookbook. And then now... We actually have the definitive tool. We have all the recipes that you're supposed to have on the elimination diet that you can prepare in your own home. We offer that program as well with the cooking instruction. And you know Allie. She's an amazing cook, and oh. she's, she gives the recipes. She, her beautiful I volunteer to test anything she wants to try. I volunteer. Yeah. Hey, I've been blessed, you know. Every time we write something, I'm like, ooh, here come the foods, you know. It's it's absolutely amazing. So, yeah, absolutely. I, we found the same thing, and that's the whole reason why we do what we do. I'm, I'm tired of people being sick, Tom. I'm really tired of so much unnecessary suffering, and we hear all these things in the news all the time about these drastic rises in disease, and you and I know. We know that if you could look at that gut, if you can change your food intake, we could stop the rises in disease. We could yep. reverse these pandemics. We could lessen the stress on the U.S. economy through our healthcare system. So it just makes sense what we're talking about here, that people would jump in and give this a shot. This isn't a lifelong diet. No, this is a functional tool for you to find out what foods f make you feel sick and what foods make you feel fabulous. We want you to eliminate your symptoms, not foods. And then if you want to eat the foods that make you feel sick, it's up to you. <laughs> it really is. It's up to you. You want to eat a ding dong once in a while or go have a Big Mac or have a Coca-Cola once in a while with some rum or something. It's up to you. It's up to you. We all are responsible for our own health, but it's the lack of knowledge mm. and it's how mm. you're raising your kids. Mm -hmm. Not you, Tom, but our <laughs> listening audience. It's how you're raising your kids because you don't know about this. Yeah. This is basic 101. Yeah. This is 101 stuff that we, we just haven't been taught. And unfortunately, we've been at the mercy of the uh, Madison Avenue mm. television screen. Right. Oh. All the commercials and the billboards about the good life and people happy and running around and bouncing around in beautiful environments and these great looking girls, and these hunks for guys, and they're guzzling Coca-Cola. And, and so, what? You know, and we, we believe all of that. Right. We believe all of that. Right. And um, so for Tom and myself and so many of us, our goal is just, hey, just look at this. Yeah. Look at this. 
Make the choice you want to make. You want to give your kid poison after you learn about this? All right, then there's nothing we can do. But if you don't know, that's the travesty. Mm. That's the travesty. You know, there's a paper published in the Journal of Attention Disorders. They looked at 130 kids with attention deficit. Mm -hmm. And they showed that every child or their parents reported a significant improvement, and that's really important, the word significant by the researchers, in all 12 DSM-4 markers of mm. attention deficit. Doesn't pay attention to detail, fails to finish work, blurts out answers, interrupts frequently, noise. All of these markers of a child that's attention deficit, every marker improved in every child on a gluten-free diet. Mm. Yeah. If that were a drug, <laughs> It'd be on the front page of every paper in the country. Billion dollar right? blockbuster. Billion dollar exactly. blockbuster. Yeah. Oh, they'd be pushing that like crazy. But there's no profit in this, right. in the foods that you eat. Mm. There's no profit. Yeah. So we, we just want you to wake up. What you do with that information is up to you, but you need to wake up. You can't mm. give your kids this garbage and wonder why they're not working hard enough in school. Yeah. You know, and that's the other thing, right? The media is telling us this whole gluten thing is, is nonsense. It's in your head. It's a digestive disorder because you don't digest wheat starches very well, some of the fructans, and, you know, it's, it doesn't really exist. Not that much of the population actually has a response to it. And I've heard your lecture on this, and you eloquently go through the literature, and you say, look at all these Italian groups who've proven this incorrect and whatnot. So I really want people to get your data. I really want people to understand where you come from, Tom, because nobody, nobody understands, unless they've worked with you on research papers and whatnot, the depth and breadth you go through to say a single word in any of your lectures. I mean, it's, it's incredible, my friend. I mean, it's so, I, I, I'm so inspired by you. I, I, I can't even begin to express that, but your gluten summit gives people an idea. It gives them the idea of the lengths that you go through to travel, to talk to these world experts and really get their first person view on why they've spent their entire lives researching these effects of gluten. So how can people get a hold of your teachings, your, your gluten summit information? Thanks, Tom. It's a really good question. We did, um, I did um, interview 29 of the world's leaders, the leaders the ones that most doctors will never have a chance to hear in our lives mm. unless you happen to unless he happens to go to a symposium and is going to give a presentation there yeah. that um, and i ask the questions of them uh, kind of sometimes a little technical but mm -hmm. and but i know the answers cuz i've read their papers yeah. but i ask the question because when they give the answer i would then say so professor are you saying and then I would interpret it into everyday language, yes. like the Army and the Air Force, Marines, or pull on a chain and breaks the weak link. Yes. And they would say, yes. Does that mean, yes. Do you hear that, people? Here we have the chair of the Celiac Society of Italy saying that non-celiac gluten sensitivity is much more prevalent than celiac disease. Mm. He sees thousands of patients. And so that is the gluten summit. We have 700 and 20 pages that mm. the transcription is 720 pages oh there's goodness. over a thousand slides wow 29 hours Ugh. of information and we think i think everyone needs to listen to this because Absolutely. when you hear all of these experts talking it, you just immediately get it yeah. as to how important this is yes and um the website is just a minute i i need to Check this just to make sure because I often do a whoops. Did I do that wrong? <laughs> I do that as well. But I have to I have to continue and say I, I've never, ever seen a summit that was so meticulously put together. I mean, your materials are absolutely clean and gorgeous and backed by so much data. It's absolutely amazing. So I, please know that I, I'm going to give a glowing recommendation for this. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. The website is thedr.com, thedoctor.com, thedr.com forward slash gluten special offer. Ah. Gluten what? special offer. And with that, you get the Gluten Summit, all 29 hours of interviews, the 720 pages of transcripts, the thousand slides. But we also give you three articles that are really important. The first one is called The Conundrum of Gluten Sensitivity. And in that article, I wrote that for you to take to your doctors. Mm, good. 
so that they can read about why the current blood tests to look for gluten sensitivity are accurate, but they're not complete. And so you can get many false negatives saying there's no problem when there really is a problem. Mm. And why that happens, and here's the studies that talk about that, and then here is the blood test that's more complete so that you can read it, and ev everyone understands it the way I wrote it, but then the doctors read this and go, oh, well, the, that makes sense. All right, well, let's check this other test. Mm -hmm. And so you can get the accurate test to find out if it's a problem for you or not. Mm -hmm. I am strongly of the opinion, and I will never say everyone needs to go off gluten. I will not say that because I'm on the public stage, mm -hmm. but I'm strongly of the opinion everyone should be checked properly mm. to see if they have a gluten sensitivity when they're not feeling well. Yes. Because 30 to 60% clinically of what we see huge. has a gluten sensitivity. That's huge. So the first article is the conundrum of gluten sensitivity. Mm -hmm. The second one is, uh, what's the title of it? Differentiating gluten-related disorders. Mm -hmm. And I identify, it just nails this whole hullabaloo that non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a fad. Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's not. And I explain in that article why that happened, why people think that way. And some people are just jumping on a bandwagon for negative press. But the, the definitive research article, as you referenced from the Italian group, you know, the, the Italian government pays for food for celiacs. Mm -hmm. They actually pay. And wow. it costs them hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Right. So they need to make sure that someone's not getting a free ride. <laughs> right. So they have 37 centers throughout Italy that are designated gluten-related disorder centers. Right. And that's where you go to get confirmation that you've got a problem with gluten. Then the government supports you. Mm -hmm. 27 of those 37 centers are gastroenterology centers. Mm-hmm. Seven are pediatric centers, a couple of them are allergy centers, a couple of internal medicine. So there's 37 centers. They looked at 17,000 patients. And what did they say? Well, absolutely, non-celiac gluten sensitivity exists. Absolutely. The most common complaint, 68% of those people had a lack of well-being. They just didn't feel good. Mm. They just felt lousy in life. 64% were tired. Yeah. And from there, it went down a little bit, but it was joint pains and numbness and tingling and neurological disorders and a foggy brain yes. and asthma, yes. skin disorders, can be from celiac, can be from non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Yes. But also, besides the gluten, which is the protein in wheat, there's other parts to mm -hmm. wheat. As you've referenced, they're called the FODMAPs, that's the carbohydrates in wheat. There are the oils in wheat called wheat germ oils. There are the lectins in wheat called wheat germ agglutinins. There are the opiates in wheat that act like opium in, in some people's bodies, if that's the weak link in their chain. There's a lot of different parts of wheat that may be the problem. It's not just gluten. Mm -hmm. But yes, this thing exists, and for many people. And so the second handout is that one that explains all of that hullabaloo mm -hmm. and where that came from and here's the science mm -hmm. and here's what the science says. And the third one is an article that was published late last year, 2014, on um, the current state of affairs in the United States for gluten-related disorders. It was published by Harvard mm -hmm. and it's a great article. People can take it, they can read it, they can print a copy out and give it to their doctors to read so that your doctors can get up to speed. Mm. So all of that, the Gluten Summit, the three articles, it's at the dr.com forward slash gluten special offer. Was that a special offer? Yes. Gluten special offer, right. Mm -hmm. And all of that, it's $97. It's less than three, it's about three bucks per world expert. So wow. if you wanna know, if you wanna really know for once and for all, that's how you find out about the information on gluten. It's well worth it. You know, it's almost as if you could be certified once you go through the gluten-free summit. I know as a, you, you offer the practitioner summit, but this is for the civilian what you have for practitioners, basically. It's, it's absolutely groundbreaking information. It's incredibly scientifically backed. And you can walk away then literate for yourself, for your family members, for your friends, for your Facebook page, whatever it is you want to talk about gluten, you will have the resources after attending this summit. So I, I 
I can't commend you enough, Tom. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's, I think people will look back in time and say, this was a resource that really shifted health in a general direction for benefit for everybody. So I'm hoping I can back up some of your data by making sure a lot of people go through the elimination diet properly, get the gluten out of their diet, and we can really move people to a different state of existence. Because this is what I see, Tom. I see people who come in and they don't have good color in their face. I see that they're tired. I see that they have that brain fog. There's no mental acuity. There's no sharpness, right? They don't have joie de vivre. They're not whistling yeah. at all. They're walking yeah. around and they're complaining about things and they have this they're negative grunting. attitude. Right. They're yes. Grunting. And then when they go on elimination diets, they get rid of the gluten. They're new human beings. They'll come back and say, oh, I have the energy to be the person I've always wanted to be. I have now the energy to be a servant to those in my life that need things from me. I can offer, I can give, I can be a steward to this planet. I can change the future now because I'm in a power position. I'm in a position of health. So yeah. I think that's what you've been gifting to everybody for as long as you've been lecturing, my friend. And I think you've outdone yourself with the Gluten Summit. So I have to honor you. I have to give you as much gratitude as I possibly can and say thank you on behalf of everybody else as well. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. And it's the same with the elimination diet with your book. And I know your thoroughness. I know how comprehensive you are. And I know that thousands and thousands of people for themselves and their kids, mm. you know, it's kids depend on the adults to feed them. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, you, you just want to learn that food makes a difference. And if, if, if we don't know that it's the gasoline on the fire that causes the inflammation, mm. then we don't think about, well, what foods are gasoline for me? You know, right. we just don't think that way. And that's what your book is going to do so well for so many people mm. is to start to understand. And here's the science and here's some great recipes. Try this one. Try this one. <laughs> and you'll score. Yeah. Everyone, you, you try one of these recipes and your family will just say, wow, that's really good. And you'll be very proud. Ah, uh, Well, thank you so much, Tom. I can't thank you enough. I appreciate your time here, and I'm sure everybody else is going to appreciate your information. So thank you again. Well, thanks, Tom. And please pass on to Allie, your lovely wife, that I really look forward to some apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, my friend. We'll it's do. a great recipe. She's got a great recipe for apple pie. Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, thank you, sir. You bet. Take care.